Hi, welcome back to The Pomegranate Girl, a knitting and creative podcast. My name is Annie and I am based in the southwest of England in Bristol. Um, and yeah, this is my little space on the internet to talk about what I have been knitting and sewing and making and also reading because I like to, to talk about the books I've been reading um, at the end of each episode and kind of any other stuff that pops up. So. I don't know what number episode we're on, I should really check. Um, but yeah, I have got a finished object to talk to you about today, which you might have already noticed um, if you've been following the past few episodes. Um, I have got a few sewing bits to talk about, some obviously some whips, um, and then a few books at the end, as well as a small acquisition. So, welcome back. Um, get, grab a snack. I'm hoping to make this episode slightly shorter than the last one that I recorded, um, which was very long. Um, so yes, let's just get into it. So the first thing that I want to talk about today is this finished object. Um, so this is the Sara sweater by Lini Hoy. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. She is, I believe, a Finnish knitwear designer, but um, this is a quite a warm jumper. Um, this is the Sara sweater. Um, so I might have to take this off once I've spoken about it because I'm getting quite warm because it is now finally heated up in the UK. Um, and we've had some like high teens uh, temperatures, which is getting pretty warm for us. Um, not as warm as it can get, but yeah, kind of more of a usual temperature. It has actually been quite cold for like April and May. Um, over the past few weeks so yeah we're finally kind of coming into normal May temperatures for the UK at least where I am um, so yeah this is the Sarah sweater um, you'll have seen it on my past two episodes it is a raglan um, turtle neck jumper although there are different neck versions that you can do um, and it has a split hem I will insert probably a photo here and I will actually insert a photo this time, um, kind of showing you the full length because I don't want to get up and ruin my camera angle. Um, but yeah, I knit this over the course of about four months. I finished it at the end of April and I cast it on just after Christmas. So it took me about four months on and off. Um, I really hit a big pause when I was seeing the yoke and I just was finding it really like, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, so yeah, I had took a bit of a break from it and then kind of restarted it and kind of tried to power on through. Um, when it's like just plain stockinette, sometimes I do really enjoy that, but I kind of just have to be in the right mood. And sometimes I want something that's a bit more engaging. Um, but yeah, I'm so happy with this. Um, it's really nice to have just finished a jumper project. It feels like a long time since I've kind of had a finished jumper project. Um, so, the view I knitted has the turtleneck um, option, so I kind of, you could wear it like this or oh, kind of like fold it down, um, which I think I might do. Yeah, I'm just going to see. I haven't actually worn this out of the house yet because it's literally just finished blocking yesterday. Um, and as I said, it's kind of been a bit too warm here in the UK for me to be wearing something with such a high neck. Um, this is knit out of Woolly Knit British 4-ply. Um, I bought a cone of it a few years ago in the colour Cinnamon Brown or just Cinnamon. And then it's also knit with a strand of uh, Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair in the colourway Breast. Um, and I just really love the combination um, of the colours together. I think they look really nice. This is, I don't have the Mohair out, but this is the... Um, cinnamon kind of on its own so you can see that um with the soft silk mohair it kind of really adds a more of a reddish tint which i really like um and yeah i just knit it mostly to pattern i did crop it slightly um just because it's not massively cropped but i have quite a short torso um so it's still the hem kind of does hit just above just around my hips um but that's kind of perfect for me i didn't want anything way longer because it just yeah wouldn't become really wearable for me um so yeah i think i knit to about 21 centimeters below once i'd split for the arms and i think in the pattern it said to knit to 27 so yeah i just removed and then the hem 
was supposed to be 12 and I think I knit it to around 10 instead so I did lop off about eight centimeters over the total kind of length of the body and then also in the arms as well and even so um sorry I've got a puff sleeved blouse on under this so the sleeves aren't kind of falling exactly how I usually would have them um but yeah even the arms are like actually quite long um you can see the cuff kind of reaches my thumb which I really like I think if you want if it's gonna have be something really cozy um it's nice to have long sleeves um so yeah super happy with this one I knit the size can't remember what size it was but it's the second largest size which I think might be an XL and it might go up to a TXL. It's not a size inclusive pattern, I will say, um, which I usually do try to avoid. Um, I try to like knit with more kind of size inclusive um, patterns. Um, but yeah, this one is unfortunately isn't. Um, this size, I think the finished bust circumference was 127 centimeters, um, which I think I've got pretty much. I haven't measured it, but that's kind of how it sits on me. Um, with, my bust measurement is about 105, but my hips are quite a bit wider. Um, so I usually have to kind of take into, unless I'm doing something really cropped, I usually have to take into um, account the my hip measurement um, so that I've still got ease on my hips um, if I'm knitting like a full length jumper. Um, but yeah, I really um, love this. Um, and yeah, super happy with it. It's also got this really lovely raglan detail. This is twisted rib um, on the <sighs> collar, turtleneck, neckband. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, and the um, cuffs and then also on the hem as well. Yeah, really love this. Would recommend the pattern. I thought it was really well written, but yeah, wouldn't. It's also not size inclusive. I think you could get a similar effect with there must be an albino mclaughlin pattern that is kind of similar in that it's turtleneck and raglan um or you could i know petite knit has a few kind of turtleneck options but i think they might all be dropped shoulder um but i'm sure someone lovely will recommend a kind of more um alternative uh size inclusive pattern down below um so yeah this is my only finished object for knitting and I'm going to be right back because this is too warm for me to be wearing right now. I'm back now that I've taken off the warmest, not the warmest sweater, but a very warm sweater um, back off. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd quickly show you um, the split hem now that it's I'm not wearing it. Um, so you kind of knit to a portion and then do a short split hem. Um, and then yeah I use tubular bind off on everything because it is a real faff but I just think it looks really nice and also is really stretchy um so I do often make the effort to do it I kind of see what mood I'm in um but because this had taken such a long time for me to knit I really wanted something that I felt reflected that and you know yeah just wanted to um do tubular bind off so I did <laughs> um but yeah it's very, it's not super drapey, but I'd say, I mean, yeah, it's fairly drapey. I think the kind of silk and mohair kind of adds to that. Um, and yeah, as you can kind of tell, it's really warm, which is great. Um, so in the kind of autumn and spring and winter months, it'll be perfect. But yeah, it's, I get too warm too quickly <laughs> um, for it to really be any use for me in the summer. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to being able to wear it in the autumn when it cools down a bit. And I'm sure because I live in the UK, it will be cold enough for me to wear it over the next few months as well, occasionally. Um, so yeah, that is my only finished object. So I wanted to move on to works in progress and I have restarted or picked back up again my Vertici oh, Vertices Unite Shawl by Stephen West. Um, so once I finished the jumper, I really wanted to cast them in another jumper, but I'm trying to kind of get through some of my works in progress first so that I can kind of clear my needles a bit and just feel a bit more like I've got the space and the kind of capacity to work on things. Um, so I have done a fair bit since I last showed this to you. Um, it's nowhere near finished, but I have done quite a bit. Um, so I have 
akkurat det skal vi se hva som er um, oh, I don't even know how to show you. Basically, I have finished the first section. Um, so I'm making the size, the larger size, there are two sizes and I'm making the larger one. Um, so yeah, I finished the first section and I have started the second section, which you do by picking up along this one of the sides of the first section. Um, and you do a bit of short row shaping here um and well they're not really short rows but it they technically are um just to kind of create more of the shape and then yeah you kind of do some more striping so i'll take you through the colors that i'm using um the white one is from le biche et bouche and it's the le, le petit lamb's wool in like cream or off-white i think um, the pink is from John Arben and it is their Yarnadelic uh, four ply slash sport um, in the shade Pink Moon, which I used for a soiree last year, I think. Um, and then the cream Le Bichet Bouchian I used for a Talvinin sweater for my mum a few years ago. And then this kind of, can you see that? Yeah. Uh, kind of dark browny ready colour which is kind of similar to my Sara sweater actually is um, another Yarnadelic shade called Galetta Guitar and the green is also from John Arben and that is the uh, Devonia 4-ply in Sage Sprig. Um, so the Sage Sprig I used for a sprouted shawl um, this is this colour um, by Jacqueline Seaslack again like two years ago now I think um, but yeah, really enjoying it. I am so glad I finished the first section because I think I mentioned in my episode, not my last one, the one before, that I was going really frustrated with just how long it was taking me. Um, this has been such a long term whip. I put it on pause for like nine months. Um, but over the past few weeks, I've been working on it again. Um, and yeah, just really... Um, looking forward to getting more progress I think once I finish this second section like this is already going way quicker than this section um but once I finish this and then can kind of move on to the third section I think everything will feel a lot more kind of like I'm making progress more quickly I think it looks like the sections get smaller kind of as you go along um so yeah really excited to have this it has been so long since I knitted a shawl well actually I say it's been so long since I knitted a shawl I knitted one last uh Christmas like over kind of from October to December um for my aunt which I didn't show on the podcast I don't think because it was kind of just when I was taking my podcasting break which was very unintended um but I knit a shawl for her which was a bee mandarin shawl in a DK weight yarn um, there was like a crescent shaped kind of garter stitch and lace shawl. I think it's called the plume shawl. Um, so yeah, I knit that for her for Chris as her Christmas gift last year. So I had knit a shawl, but that was, and I think I might have said in like some of my previous episodes, I'm not a massive shawl knitter. Um, I love the finished result and I love the idea of having a shawl. I just don't love knitting them. I find I just find them a bit tedious sometimes um especially when it's like you're going back and back and forth back and forth um so maybe I just need to find some like better shawl patterns that are a bit more I find a bit more engaging um but yeah I am so excited to have this as kind of a finished object in the autumn because it will be so lovely and just like warm and squishy because these are all non-superwash um, woolly wools so I just think it will be really warm and really cosy and will kind of double up as a bit of like a blanket as well as like a more of a scarf which is how I tend to wear my shawls. So yes, um, I have another colour that I'm using for this which is a Tuku wool four ply um, in like a dark green colour. Um, so those are my five colours and yeah, I'm knitting it on the cord four needles which are 3.5 millimeter um, needles so I'm using my chaggy interchangeables. But yeah, really enjoying it and yeah, just glad to be making some progress on it. So yeah, that is my first whip. My second one is kind of a whip but kind of also a half finished object. Um, I just need to... Oh, oh, they're here. 
I have my knitting basket <laughs> with me, <laughs> um, which kind of has everything that I'm working on in it. Um, so I just have all my project bags in there and I kind of pick and choose which one I want to work from. And we have that by one of our like chairs in the living room. Um, so yeah, the next uh, whip is, as I said, kind of a half finished object and it is this sock. Um, so the this is the Hearth and Home Socks by Lindsay Fowler. Um, and so yeah, I think last time I was about here um, on the first sock and I've now finished sock number one and where is it? Um, I have just got to finish the gusset decreases and I'm back on to doing the foot of the second sock. So this is a pattern that is from my Make 9 for this year, my knitting Make 9, um, just because I love the texture of the sock and it's really easy, it's just a really simple knitting pattern but it just feels, it's not a vanilla sock, it's a bit slightly more elevated, it's a bit more engaging because you've cut semi got to concentrate on what you're doing like not really it's quite mindless but you're not just knitting 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 there's a bit more to it um it's got a really nice twisted rib cuff um just i just i don't think the heel that lindsay fowler writes in the pattern is a slip stitch heel but that's what i prefer doing so that's what i did um and then yeah i'm just you knit plain on the bottom so once you get to the foot it's also more speedy because you're only doing the pattern on kind of the top half of the sock and then I just did um, my normal decreases which is kind of also what's in the pattern which is the you know very standard wedge toe. So this is the, I can't remember what the yarn is, oh it's Ainsworth and Prynne classic sock in the four ply weight. The colour is a kind of one of a kind one that was in a sock set that they released um, that I bought I think last year. Um, I've spoken a lot on this channel about how I usually don't use superwash, um, wool, nylon sock blends. I just prefer other kind of 100% wool, non-superwash um, yarns. I just prefer the feel of them on my feet. It's just a personal preference. But I love this colour so much. It's this like really lovely brownie pink colour that is one of my favourites. And it's just has some very beautiful, like quite subtle kind of variegation I'd say it's not really speckles but it's yeah just really lovely you sometimes get these bits that you can see here that are slightly darker um but yeah really beautiful colorway so I just kind of bit the bullet and was like well if I don't wear them like that it is what it is I just loved working with this color um and I wanted socks so yeah they have been really enjoyable to knit they've definitely been like a slow burner they're just something I work on when I'm traveling um or like I'm going somewhere so this past weekend it's been a bank holiday in in the UK for uh the coronation of the new king um and yeah me and my partner utilized the opportunity of a bank holiday to go away it's actually was our anniversary so we went away for the weekend and we went to York um, which is actually where I grew up. I spent the first kind of 10 years of my life there. Um, so yeah, and have been back to visit a few times since we moved. Um, my family still have some friends there. Um, but yeah, just went with my partner. Didn't, wasn't like, it wasn't a kind of family visit. It was just with us two. And he's only been like once or twice before um, when he was a kid. So it was really nice to go back and kind of take him round. And we did some really nice things. We ate at some lovely places. Um, and we just, yeah, kind of relaxed, did a bit of sightseeing, bit of shopping. Um, me and my partner love a good charity shop. Um, so we did quite a few book charity shops, which was great. Um, but yeah, um, so, the whole point of that tangent was to say that I got quite a bit done on the journey up because it's a four hour train ride from uh, Bristol to York. It's really actually really easy, but it is a longer train journey. Um, definitely like the longest one I've done in a while. I usually only really go down to like Exeter or London, which is about two hours absolutely max. Um, so yeah. I had plenty of knitting time and did some in the evenings as well. So I had like gotten halfway through the calf, finished the calf, did nearly all the leg. And then when we got back yesterday, I 
um, finished off the heel flap that I'd started on the train on the journey back and kind of did the gusset decreases. So now they are in a good place for me to take out and about again. And I'm going down to Exeter, which is where my partner's family live and are from. Um, so I'm going down, we're going down this weekend, so I'll probably take them with me then um, just for the journey and any like spare time we've got. Um, so yeah, really enjoying those. I think I am knitting the adult size small, which is the kind of my usual stitch count. And I'm knitting them on 2.25, which again, is my usual sock knitting needle. Um, I never gauge swatch for socks anymore. I just kind of go with it, unless they're colour work, in which case I do. Or if I'm trying like a really different yarn, um, I sometimes will gauge swatch, but I often don't. Um, I just kind of go with it and cast them on and I can always rip them back if they don't fit. Um, so yeah, really happy to have made a bit more progress with these. Um, I feel like I've actually made quite a lot of progress in quite a short amount of time because they were on my needles for so long, um, just being worked on whenever in the background. So yeah, very happy to kind of get these finalised um, so that I can move on to a different pair of socks, which will be my other travel knit once those are done. Um, the last kind of yarny uh, work in progress that I'm actively working on is a new one um, and it is a new cast on. I have been working on my C size sweater by Petite Knit um, but I haven't worked on it in so long because I've been focusing on some other things but I do need to pick that up probably once I've finished something else I'll pick that C size sweater back up because I just need to do the arms um, and then I can gift it to my friend. Um, I'm knitting it for my friend who's expecting her first baby with her partner. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to finish that and send it off to her. She doesn't know and she doesn't watch this podcast. Um, so yeah, it's a complete surprise. So hopefully her and her partner like it. She's due in August, so I've got a bit of time to um, knit it. But I say that it's actually like May uh, now, like the beginning of May. So not that long so I probably need to get a bit of a crack on just because I also want to get some other gifts for them um and also maybe make some dungarees I've got quite a lot of leftover denim fabric not that I use for this dress but that I use for some trousers that's very similar to this and I thought I could make some dungarees out of it because it's not really enough to make anything for myself and I don't think I'd really use it in anything but I remembered that my friend is having her baby and I was like oh that would be maybe I can make some like dungarees um because they are not announcing the gender until she's had the baby they know but they're choosing to kind of keep it from everyone so I thought dungarees were a nice option um and were very gender neutral so yeah I will probably yeah need to get a crack on with the jumper so that I can kind of make everything and send it over to them before August <laughs> um so yeah um next cast on is not actually knitting. I have joined the many people who love to crochet blankets. Um, so a few weeks ago, um, I was just having a think about my stash and I have a lot of yarn and a lot of kind of leftovers, which isn't enough for a full project, um, but I maybe and obviously could use for colour work but sometimes they're like super wash um or I maybe wouldn't see me using those colours together um and also just I wanted to get them out of my stash so I thought a good way to do that would be to make a blanket and the idea of knitting a blanket didn't really appeal but the idea of crocheting one did I have done a bit of crochet I taught myself to crochet actually before I kind of properly picked up knitting. I've known how to knit for quite a long time, since I was like in my early teens, um, but I never really knitted continuously and kind of bigger projects until 20, the end of 2020. Um, but a few months before that, I did teach myself to crochet, having completely failed to teach myself to crochet as a teenager. I tried and I just could not do it. But with the help of YouTube and like some patience and I think also COVID lockdowns really helped because I didn't have anything else to be doing, um, I taught myself to crochet. So I've made a few pieces. I think the main thing I made was like a hexagon granny square style cushion cover, which is at my mum's house. Um, and 
I used made that and then I made a few other like very small things and then kind of realized that crochet wasn't for me and it's great for I think it's really great for homewares but personally I prefer the kind of look of knitted garments rather than crocheted garments um just on my personal style um although there are some beautiful crochet garments that um one of my friends crochets and she makes beautiful crochet garments um but she's way more talented than me um and they, yeah they look amazing on her so you can make beautiful crochet garments but just for me I prefer knitting them um and I just kind of prefer the act of knitting but I did really want to try doing some crochet and I thought it'd be a really good way of kind of using up some of my stash so I cast on a granny stripe blanket which is I just feel like it's such a like knitting podcaster thing to say and then people use them as long-term whips which I think is great because I'm just don't think this will be something I get finished quickly um but I will show you uh, I haven't worked on it in a few weeks and I now don't know where my crochet hook is so that's a great start um let me see if I can find it <laughs> Having now chucked loads of balls of yarn on the floor, I have now found the crochet hook. Just, the one thing I find about crochet, I don't know how you just stop, you don't stop your hook coming out. Can someone explain how that works, please? Because <laughs> I haven't figured it out yet. Um, it's fine because a lot of what I'm, the kind of yarns I'm using are non-superwash at the moment, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and crochet fill is quite easy to pick up, especially on something like this. Um, but yeah, I just never seem to, whenever I pick some, this up, I'm always like, oh, I don't know where my hook's gone and things have come out and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I have started this blanket. <laughs> this is what I've got so far. Um, it's not going to fit on the screen, but yeah, um, I'm roughly following a tutorial from Attic24, who has a lovely blog full of loads of amazing, um, crochet tutorials and patterns it's kind of what I used when I first started to learn to crochet as an adult um so yeah she has a pattern on there for a crochet granny, granny stripe blanket um I don't know if it's on Ravelry I have a feeling it is but I'm not sure if it's the same kind of one as the blog post that I'm using but yeah it's free um and I'm roughly following it I'm following it um for kind of the pattern but I think I don't think I've cast on as many stitches as she recommends casting on and I'm not sure if I'll do the same border that she uses in the pattern um if I do a border at all I'm kind of a bit meh about doing a crochet border but um yeah this is what I've got so far so yeah it's just very simple um and as I said, I'm kind of using leftovers so this is a wharf mill DK in the colour harvest which is from Woolly Knit this white is, I think, a Dererum Natura Ulysse. Um, same for this green. This grey is Garthenor Priscelli held together. Um, and then this is a Mondine uh, from Rosa Pomore, which is a sock yarn, also held double. So yeah, these two are held double and then the rest are kind of DK weight yarns. Um, so yeah, held double fingering, I should say. Um, I'm not really, I've got so many yarns. I'll kind of show you how big. This is a knitting project bag I made ages ago, by the way, a patchwork one. And yeah, this is full of leftovers, um, which are what I'm using for this project. Um, I'm not really following like a colour combination. I haven't planned it at the moment. I've kind of got like colour neutral, colour neutral. I don't know if I'll stick to that. We'll just kind of see how it goes. A lot of the colours I'm using are quite muted. I don't, don't know if they're muted, but they're quite like, um, like heathered, I suppose, or like these, this yellow and this green, especially, um, I'd say that, yeah, I don't really know how to describe them. I don't know if it's going to look nice. It will just be practical. If anything, it will just be something nice to use when I go camping. Um, if we're going like, or somewhere, if someone's going somewhere in the car, um, Neither me or my partner drive at the moment, but I'm just envisioning at some point in when this is done in like five years time. Um, even if we don't use it in the house, it would just be nice to have made something practical out of leftovers. Just the idea of that 
really appeals to me um the kind of whole using up what you've got just ethos I just yeah i'd much kind of rather do that or donate them um but yeah so that's kind of what i've chosen to do um haven't worked on this in a few weeks but it's yeah i'm just i'm not gonna put any kind of time pressure on myself to do it i'm just gonna kind of do it as and when um I kind of feel like crocheting as I said I don't love crocheting that much like, I can enjoy it but it's does it's not for me I don't f I find I have to concentrate on it more than knitting and it's it's not something I automatically reach for over other projects but it's just going to be a very casual long-term whip that I probably won't finish for a few years um but will kind of I can just pick up as and when and yeah hopefully use up some bits of my stash um so that i can yeah just get it more down i don't think it's i have a particularly large stash by any means but it would just be nice um to kind of for it to not take up as much room and yeah as i said just use over leftovers um so yeah those are all my knitting kind of works in progress and before i move on to sewing and books i just quickly wanted to talk about one acquisition um which is two skeins of yarn so I have been, there's kind of a backstory to this, I've been a long-term admirer, oh I'm giving you a sneak peek, <laughs> of um, Emily Foden who is the kind of creator and owner behind Viola Yarns for a very long time, um, kind of since I picked up knitting really. Um, I can't remember kind of how I got introduced to her um, but she yeah, is a owner of Viola Yarns and she has also written a beautiful knitting book called Knits About Winter, which I have knit quite a few things. Well, I say quite a few things. I've knit a soiree jumper from and I have knit quite a few of her kind of sock recipe because I really love the way she writes her sock patterns and I just kind of use, um, have used that pattern quite a few times for like gifts. There's loads of sizes, so I've used them for my boyfriend and for my dad um, and also for socks for myself just yeah they're just her colors her way of designing is really lovely um and she yeah has been i think she's been in the knitting world a long time and i just love kind of the ethos behind her brand um and i've always wanted to try her yarn but she is based in rural canada and her yarn itself i don't think is expensive it's just the shipping um she kind of recommends overseas customers to use track shipping which is completely fair enough it makes sense it's insured so that if something gets lost she can you know claim back the money it completely makes sense it just that is a lot more expensive than like standard shipping um so it's quite a big investment for me and i've never really felt like kind of in the position to buy any of her yarn before even though i loved it and she used to be stocked at loop london um and that stopped, I think, about a year ago, um, which is sad. And I kind of always missed out because I always, her yarn is on the slightly like the more expensive side. And I never really committed and bought anything while she was being stocked at Loop. And then I read recently that she is actually closing down Viola Yarns. Um, and yeah, very exciting. She's got some like, love, sounds what, sounds like she's going to be moving on to other really exciting adventures. But I was really sad because I've always wanted to try her yarn and I yeah love her patterns and just love the colours that she creates. She is such a talented dyer um, and I just really really love kind of her work. So I kind of thought okay this is probably going to be my last chance to buy any of her yarn like new and I have looked at buying it kind of um from these stashes before and there's never really been any colors i like that would ship um that have been like from sellers that have been in the uk um so i was like i just kind of bit the bullet and bought two skeins of yarn from her and this is what they are um this is her west country four ply which is actually i think spun by john arbin um textiles so I did feel a bit bad that I was buying yarn that had kind of been spun fairly nearby to me from me that had then been sent to Canada to be dyed and then sent back. Um, but I also think I really wanted to support her yarn and her business before she closed. And yeah, it was a very special treat. Um, but I love this colour 
so much it's this beautiful kind of kind of I don't know how to describe it it's obviously lilac but it's very kind of almost like a dirty lavender color and that sounds really like off-putting but it's just like this beautiful grey lavender and I just love it. Um, so this is colour 181 and I bought two skeins of this and the composition is 50% Exmoor Horn, 30% Blueface Leicester and 20% Wensleydale. It's 388 metres per 100 grams and yeah just is so beautiful and I was so excited to receive this in the post. Um, there weren't any customs charges um, on the this. I don't know if I got lucky or I think I remember Rebecca from the Crayer Bear podcast saying as long as your order value was under either 125 or 150 British pounds then you wouldn't be charged customs but if any, if your order was above that then you would be charged customs um, and yeah I think because my order was kind of below that amount the they didn't charge customs. Um, so yeah it I was a bit nervous that I'd have to pay customs on top of what was already kind of an expensive purchase or very expensive purchase for me at least but totally worth it for me um and yeah feel very lucky that I've been able to try some of um, Emily's gorgeous yarns before she kind of closed um so having just said in this episode how much I don't like knitting shawls I bought this to make a shawl <laughs> Um, I was kind of thinking about what I'd want to make and I didn't really have enough funds to buy a jumpers or a sweaters quantity worth of yarn um, from Emily but I didn't want to buy sock yarn either because I did think about it but I was like oh I kind of want something that's going to be a bit more visible if I'm going to use like really beautiful yarn um, so I was having a bit of a think and then I have really wanted to knit the Waiting for Rain Shawl, which I believe is by Sylvia McFadden for ages, ever since. I mean, there's so many beautiful versions. I think it's an older pattern nowadays. Um, or not older, but it's it's not super new. Um, so there's so many beautiful versions that I've seen on Instagram and I've also seen on, on Ravelry. Um, and I've also seen uh, Ophelia from Orchid's Heart, her beautiful version that she knit a few years ago, I think. Um, and I've always really wanted to knit it because it's beautiful like crescent shaped shawl um, with in its garter but it's got these beautiful lace panels in it and <laughs> yeah having just said that I don't really like knitting shawls I do love the finished product so I thought I would buy the yarn for that so yeah um really and I think this will suit the pattern really well this kind of yeah kind of muted grey lavender colour um so yeah excited teasies I will not probably cast it on for a while just because as I said don't love knitting shawls and I'd like to finish my vertices unite shawl first but I'm just going to stash it away and kind of keep it and probably take it out and look at the lovely colours every now and again um so maybe towards the end of this year or next year I'll um, get around to actually knitting it um because I do in winter I wear my shawls every day I have two that I've knitted and one which is a crescent shaped shawl that I which is the sprouted shawl by Jacqueline Cieslack that I wear every day in winter um if it's cold enough and it often is um and I wear it so much and I get so much use out of it so I just need to commit and actually knit shawls <laughs> um and I'm hoping the construction of the waiting for rain shawl is quite interesting I think it utilizes short rows and there's lace so I'm hoping it will be quite engaging um and yeah I just really really want the finished object so yeah that's my very exciting acquisition um and yeah just very excited to cast that on at some point once as I said I finished this finished my vertices unite so I next wanted to do, quickly have a chat about what I have been sewing um so I haven't been doing quite as much sewing recently I say over the past month I've done a lot more knitting which has been really nice I kind of got into a phase of a few months kind of from January onwards where I did a lot of sewing um which has been lovely and been really nice but I kind of miss doing as much knitting um but I've been taking a bit more time over the past months to do more knitting and finding that balance when you have so many hobbies that you love doing it's just the eternal challenge and also maintaining great relationships 
uh, with everyone and like yeah trying to ba balancing things as an adult I just don't I don't even I don't even have kids you know I just have a full-time job which is not you know I just I feel like I've got a lot of spare time and there's not enough time in the day for me to do everything I want to do um but yeah so kind of been trying to figure out that balance of sewing knitting other hobbies other life stuff my job my relationship my family my friends <laughs> um but yeah um I have been still doing some sewing so I thought I'd quickly also talk about what I'm wearing because both these things I'm wearing are things that I've made um so this pink shirt or blouse is the Anthea blouse from Anna Allen patterns I have made two of these and I've used the sleeves from this pattern in a few other dresses um it's just a really nice it's like a simple kind of neckline but with these amazing sleeves and it just goes straight down um this fabric was is you can kind of see there like this lovely kind of textured quite sheer fabric um and I bought it from a fabric shop an online fabric shop called System in Tarka last year or the year before um and I made this shirt last year I really like it and I really like it under this dress this is the Camden pinafore I think from Nina Lee um it's kind of a what do you call this my mind's going completely like blind not blind but I can't remember but the construction um oh, what is it called I can't remember the construction of this bodice but basically <laughs> you've got like a seam that goes from like here to here um and then there's a seam here it's a fully lined pinafore dress and it's also you can just make the skirt version it's got an invisible zip in the back uh, which I think was my first time doing an invisible zip with an invisible zip footer foot on my sewing machine and it made such a big difference so if you've been trying to do invisible zips with a normal uh, kind of foot on your sewing machine um, I would highly invest spending the like 10 to 15 pounds that I spent on my uh, invisible zip foot because it honestly was game changing and it makes it look so much better um, and I really wish I'd invested before I made last summer one of my friends got married and I made a dress with an invisible zip without that invisible zip footer and I really wish I'd invested in that footer foot <laughs> before making that dress um but yeah um this is a really nice pattern i don't think either of these are massively size inclusive i have to say um so i do apologize um but i'll leave them both linked down below um this is a really nice pattern as i said what did i say it's completely lined so this is all um, the bodice is lined and the skirt is lined it's got really nice pockets details on it and I wear this a lot um it's really good for work and I can just wear like a blouse or a t-shirt under it um and yeah I just really really like this I just feel I find it really versatile um and the denim was from a shop called New Craft House which is does dead stock fabric they have a real life shop in London but they also sell online and then similarly this cotton was from Simply Fabrics Brixton uh, it's just this like mustard stripe um 100 cotton um just like poplin i suppose um and yeah simply fabrics brixton is also a dead stock fabric shop that also has a shop in london but sells online as well um and they yeah i love buying dead stock fabric um i think you can get some really nice quality fabrics for kind of slightly cheaper and i like kind of the environmental ethos um, if you don't know, dead stock fabric is where a factory or a designer will have too much fabric for the kind of clothes that they have um, been, or the amount of clothes that they've been ordered to make, so it will be kind of leftovers um, that they can't use in other projects, so they sell it to um, kind of agents or directly to businesses who will then resell it usually at a reduced price um because they've got it at a reduced price because it's kind of leftovers um so it tends to be kind of smaller quantities of fabric so and it's obviously probably non-repeatable a lot of the time um so it's a bit more rare but 
it's great and a really lovely way of buying fabric I think if you kind of are patient it's not great if you're after something really specific and need it like right away but if you kind of buy fabric like me where I kind of buy it in advance and with a project in mind really yeah would really recommend I'll link both the shops down below um and yeah <laughs> big tangent on what I'm wearing um but I quickly wanted to talk about this blouse that I spoke about last time, I showed you the fabric and I just wanted to show you the finished object. So this is the Honey, ooh, hair in my mouth, Honey Blouse by Fibre Mood. Um, I'm so sorry, it's not ironed. I would usually iron this, um, but I've literally just taken it straight off the clothes dryer um, or clothes airer. Uh, so that's why you can see a nice line. <laughs> um, but this is a pattern from Fibre Mood magazine and it's very cropped boxy blouse with this beautiful ruffled uh, collar and so, not really puffed sleeves but they're three quarter lengths um i'll insert a line drawing here and you can kind of see the modifications i made so i made the view without the ruffle on the bottom button band and i also omitted the original pattern has these beautiful like tie cuffs um so this cuff is kind of like a bow detail so that's how you kind of um adjust the cuff as it were on the sleeve i chose to admit that just because i thought it was a bit too fussy like it's already got this really nice collar detail and i just thought i didn't want something overly fussy and if i wanted to wear this under jumpers i just thought that would kind of get in the way but i kind of regret not doing it um i just think it would have looked nice with it um but yeah I think I will definitely make this pattern again in the future so we'll probably do a version with the kind of original sleeves um and yeah this it's quite a cropped blouse I will say like I've got as I kind of mentioned earlier I've got a very short torso so it kind of works for me and I just wear it um with some trousers some Penmona pants from Alma Allen that um are kind of wide leg kind of chambray pants and I wear that or trousers um, that I wear to work and it's yeah just really nice and I think once I've got a few more pairs of jeans in my wardrobe it'll be perfect with jeans um I did try it on under this uh pinafore and it was just a bit didn't like them together but I did kind of envision it would look nice under things like that um and yeah it's just lovely this fabric is a brown gingham from cloth house which is an online and in-person fabric shop in London um they do beautiful fabrics and I bought some after getting some money for my birthday um but yeah I really really love this I finished it and tried it on and I wasn't really sure about it I wasn't sure if it really suited me and then the more I wore it the more I was like oh this is actually great and I've worn it both like completely buttoned up and then also with the top button undone and I quite like that when you kind of have the top button undone you, the collar is looks a bit more relaxed and it doesn't look kind of as peter panish so i like that kind of versatility um and yeah it's just really really lovely it would look nice if i'd ironed it but to be honest i didn't have time <laughs> um and yeah these buttons are really nice these are from textile garden um and yeah just really like it's gingham it's got ruffles on it it's very much my vibe <laughs> um so yeah we'd recommend that pattern it also has it's got to show you a kind of lovely gathered yoke detail that i really like i think it just adds a bit of extra interest um so yeah really enjoy making that and have worn it quite a bit and we'll definitely make that pattern again maybe in just like a white cotton white lawn maybe um so yeah i finished that a few weeks ago and since then I have started work on another project that I showed the fabric for last week, or last week, last episode, which is the shepherd skirt from Merchant and Mills. Again, this is definitely not in a position to show you where it looks at all finished. Um, actually, you wouldn't really be able to even see the shape of it. <laughs> so I'll insert a line drawing so you can see what the finished result will look like. But basically, it is a the pattern it's a skirt with a waistband buttons and it's got these lovely pleat details in it um this is the line drawing on the back um 
so you can see there it's just yeah quite simple but <laughs> the construction of this skirt isn't I, I would say it's not a beginner's pattern um it's just the way the pockets and the sides are constructed are fine I'm getting there it's just quite a lot of steps so I'm just kind of taking it one step at a time um so yeah this is the fabric this is a lovely linen from Merchant and Mills it is <laughs> another check because that's all I live in um and it's this brown background with this lovely like navy detail um so I would say I've like constructed the skirt and I'm now doing the pocket slash side openings so once I've done that I will be on to the waistband and doing the buttonholes so I'd say I'm about halfway through um I started working on this yesterday once we got back from York um as you can see halfway through the pockets construction um I yeah I think this is one of the a, a pattern that would really benefit from either photographs in the pattern or a kind of step-by-step -step sew along um Merchant Mills don't really tend to do those on their website but they're definitely something that a lot of indie pattern companies do do that I find so useful um I know quite like Helen's Claws no not Helen's Helen's Closet does it for some of their patterns I know Friday Patchy pa Friday Pattern Company do it for theirs and it's just really handy if you're like looking at the illustrations in the pattern and you can't quite figure out like the detail like I think that either needs to be more close-ups in the pattern or as I said like a kind of walkthrough on their YouTube channel or their like photos on their website that kind of take you through the steps because I just think it'd be a bit clearer um because at the moment I kind of feel like I'm doing everything a bit blindly um like I'm just kind of doing what they tell me to do and hoping for the best um so yeah pocket construction is going well I think I will be able to report back if I'm was successful um in the next episode um but yeah if you've sewn this pattern do let me know what you thought and if you kind of I might it might just be that I'm not advanced enough and I've taken on a bit more than I can chew um but I think just because it's my first time doing pa like a pocket construction like this it's a bit harder um but yeah you obviously can't really see but <laughs> this will be gathered up so hopefully by the next episode I will be able to show you what it will look like finished um but I am enjoying it I have never really had issues with Merchant and Mills patterns before I've made quite a few of their patterns um, and I've always found them for the most part pretty clear um but yeah just this time when it's with a construction that is new to me I'm just finding it a bit confusing so yeah as I said just trying to take it slowly take one step at a time and trying not to get too overwhelmed with everything um, but yeah, I'm enjoying it and hopefully we'll get a bit of time to work on it this week. Finally, today I wanted to talk about some of the books I'd been reading. Um, so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so if you're only here for the knitting and the sewing, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you're working on in the comments below. But if you are interested, I'm quickly going to chat through some of the books I have read recently and what I'm currently reading. So first up, I think last time I spoke to you, I had <laughs> just bought a few books um, in London from Daunt Books. I had picked up Post After Post, Post Mortem by UCR Lorac and Strong Poison by Dorothy L. Sayers. So I've now finished both of these. Um, this one, Post After Post Mortem, is about the death of an author and her family are all authors or kind of literary types. Um, it was the first ECR Lorik book I read. It's a golden crime mystery, which is what I read a lot of at the moment. Um, it's one of my favourite kind of genres. I spoke a, quite a lot about it in the last episode. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed ECR Lorik um, and her writing style. Um, and would definitely read more of her books. And I'd recommend this, especially if you like kind of murder mysteries um, that are... Kind of yeah literary focused it's quite interesting um i thought the plot was good um the characters were good but i thought you don't i didn't get as attached to the detective but i think she has a recurring detective kind of similar to say 
Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane or uh, Poirot or Miss Marple. Um, and I'm not sure if this detective is one of her recurring ones. I think she had a few. Um, but yeah, definitely enjoyed. I thought it was had some good twists and turns in it. And yeah, would really recommend. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to reading more ECR Lorac. I know she wrote quite a few war-based mysteries, um, which I'm really looking forward to reading. So pieces that are actually set in World War II um, and kind of utilised that kind of setting quite well. So I'd like to read one of those next, I think. Um, but yeah, would recommend. I think I gave it like 3.5 stars on Goodreads um, that I got for it fairly quickly. I then moved on to Strong Poison um, by Dorothy L. Sayers, which was the next book in the Lord P. Twinsey slash Harriet Vane series. Um, again, another Golden Age detective novel. Um, and this is the novel that it introduces us to Harriet Vane, who I won't say any more about in case you haven't read any of the books. But yeah, Lord Peter Whimsey is a great character. I think Dorothy L. Sayers is such a good writer. Um, I read the first slew of books in the series when I was about 17 or 18, I think, or maybe 18, 19. I was definitely at university, um, slash just, had just left. Um, so it's been a few years actually since I picked the series back up. And I'm not sure, I think I might have read this before and completely forgotten <laughs> that I'd read it because apparently we do have a copy of this at home, which is where the majority of my books live um, at my mum's house. Um, so I don't know if I had read it and I'm kind of always reading it and thinking, oh, this does seem a bit familiar. Um, but I basically, I usually keep track of all my books on my Goodreads account and I recently got locked out of it, can't regain access. And it's where all of the books I've read since I was about 15 are logged. Um, and I'm 26 now, so it's 11 years of reading, um, if not more, I think. Um, so sadly, I can't see which books I've maybe read before. Um, I've tried contacting Goodreads help and they haven't been helpful um, in this instance. I'm sure there's it's not really their fault. There's nothing they can do. It's a security issue. Um, but yeah, it's just very frustrating. Um, but there's nothing really that can be done about it. I just kind of have to move on and yeah it's just going to happen where I've probably read things that I have actually read before but a long time ago um so yeah this installment was great it's one of the more shorter ones the first kind of lot in the series are shorter and the next one that's actually the book I'm currently reading is actually not the next one after this there's another one after this that I have definitely read and then after that they get longer and longer which yeah is something it's really nice I feel like you don't often get really chunky detective fiction from this era so yeah it's nice to have longer stories um more character development um but yeah really enjoyed this one and yeah would highly recommend Lord Peter Whimsey mysteries if you haven't read them before they're great um and then I read another another Agatha Christie so I read the Body in the Library, which is the second Miss Marple book. Um, I read the first Miss Marple quite a few years ago. I think I read... When did I read it? It must have been around the same time um, that I kind of got back into detective fiction. I think I might have mentioned in my last episode that I loved uh, Agatha Christie as like an early teen. I started reading all of the Poirot books kind of in order because my school library had the complete collection. I think Agatha Christie's, one of her family members, I think one of her like grandchildren, must live near my school um, because they donated a whole set of her books when we got um, a new library built. So yeah, my school had like the complete collection of Agatha Christie books. Um, and yeah, I started reading all the Poirot books um, from the library at school. Um, I don't know how far I got in I got. I think probably only read about the first 10. Um, but I never read any Miss Marple, so then I read one later on in my maybe late teens, early twenties, um, and last year I started watching both the David Suchet Poirot and the ITV kind of early 2000s Marple series, which has two actors playing Miss Marple, whose names I now can't remember, but it's the ITV version. It's not the Jane Hickson version that was earlier on. It's the later versions. Um, and loved them. 
and kind of that really kick-started like my Agatha Christie interest. So yeah, um, read the second Miss Marple book. I obviously, because I've watched this series, I kind of know um, or roughly remember what happens, um, but it was still really enjoyable. And I do want to finish all of the Marple books before returning to Poirot and reading all of those as well at some point. And also, obviously, Agatha Christie has a massive catalogue, so there's lots for me to read, um, So, but I've got time. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed this, would really recommend Agatha Christie if you've never read her. She's, you know, she's so popular for a reason. She is honestly, as the very well-deserved title of Queen of Crime, one of the Golden Age Queens of Crime, along with obviously Dorothy L. Sayers and Naya Marsh and a host of other amazing authors. Um, so yeah, would really recommend. And I think the next one in this series is mm, uh, the, the, the Moving Finger, which actually I bought over the weekend in a secondhand bookshop. So perfect. Um, yeah, really enjoyed, would really recommend. Um, so I am now reading another Golden Age detective novel because that's all I read. Um, and this is the next um, Dorothy L. Sayers novel in the Peter Whimsy series. So this is Have His Carcass. I think this is number seven. I don't have... Yeah, seven, not including the two short story collections that are also kind of listed. Um, so actual novel number seven, I think. Number seven, <laughs> double checking. Um, this one features Harriet Vane as well as P Lord Peter Whimsy, and it is a Lord Harriet. It starts off with Harriet Vane at the beach, and she's on a walking holiday in the southwest of England. Um, I think it sounds like it's Devon somewhere. Um, and she wakes up and finds a man on the beach, and he has been murdered. Um, and Lord Peter Whimsy gets involved. And it kind of goes from there and um, kind of finding out about this man and did he commit suicide was he murdered the plot goes on um yeah these reprint covers that i think hodder did are beautiful i love them um and yeah as i mentioned earlier this is kind of when the point in the series where the novels get slightly longer so i think this is around 450 pages um i am um, on page 194 so I'm getting towards being halfway there um, and yeah just really enjoying it I don't know when I first started reading these novels I think I didn't find them as enjoyable as like Agatha Christie um, but the more the later kind of in the series I get the more I enjoy them um, and yeah I just my mum was also a big fan of uh, Dorothy L. Sayers and really loves her books so it's been nice. We've both kind of been, re um, I've been reading them for the first time. I think my mum has been rereading some of them as well as reading some of them for the first time. Um, so yeah, it's just really nice to have her kind of know about them. She was a big influence on my reading anyway, and is, has always been into crime novels. So it, she's always full of good recommendations. Um, and I'm sure once I finish this and return it home to my main book collection, which is at some point, hopefully mum will be housed at my own house instead of yours. Um, my mum will probably read this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've really in, been enjoying it. It's definitely, I've kind of, I keep having this thing at the moment where I'll be reading in the evening and I just go straight to sleep and I'll fall asleep and I'll be like, I can't read anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall asleep. Um, so I've been trying to set aside some more time earlier on in the evening or on the weekend for reading. Um, because otherwise I just don't get much done. Um, but yeah, that's everything I have been reading recently. I think after this Dorothy L. Sayers, I might have a bit of a detective fiction break. Um, I've got a few other books that I'd like to read. Um, and yeah, just would be nice to get to some other things um, before 
definitely returning to the Dorothy L. Sayers series. Um, but yeah, I hope you have enjoyed this episode and this hopefully will be slightly shorter. I've been recording it in segments, so I can't see the total time. But yeah, hopefully not as long as last time. I hope you're all well. Um, and if you're in the UK, if you I hope you enjoyed the coronation bank holiday, whatever you chose to do. Um, and yeah, if or if you're watching it from other parts of the world. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you all again soon. Please do let me know what you're working on down below. Um, and yeah, I always also always recommend or always welcome book recommendations. Always needed. So if you've got anything you're reading at the moment that is particularly good, do let me know and I'll check it out. Um, but yeah, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>